In Homeric epic and tragedy, women's bodies are politicized as the means by which the epic heroes secure or lose power. Both establish a narrative of sexual violence where the sexual captivity of the enemy's women eradicates the enemy's oikos and strips them of his kleos and time by transferring sexual ownership of the wife from her husband to his foe. The ideology of male victory thus relies on the fate of the enemy's women. Homer's Iliad refers to this motif frequently. The fall of Troy is officially marked by the capture of the Trojan women. In Euripides' Hecuba and Trojan Women, the fates of the captured women are described in relation to how their sexualities can be used, with varying degrees of success, to improve their new circumstances. Women as war booty were the tools for the total destruction of the Trojan enemy and their sexual violation was the piece de resistance. Kathy L. Gatza defines the practice of aggravated rape in keeping the victims alive, or of aggravated rape in killing the victims or leaving them to die, and of targeting this practice against women and girls belonging to peoples who have been the focus of martial aggression as populist ravaging warfare. The rape of a freeborn woman within one's own society, which was committed by another member of that society, was considered an offense. But the rape of women and girls who were previously freeborn within a now conquered society, who became war captives, was not just customary practice, but commonly a top-down martial one. The Homeric and Euripidean examples of sexual violence against women as a consequence of the male ideology of victory are not without historical corroboration. Herodotus alludes to pre-adolescent girls being targets of populous ravaging warfare in his description of the Pelasgian raid at Brauron. He also describes instances of non-Greeks raping women, including the Phocian women being raped successively and violated to death by the Persians. Thucydides also explicitly identifies the practice of andropodizing, the enslavement of specific groups of people, namely those who do not possess the abilities to fight back. One example is the Athenians debating using this practice against the Mytilenians after the Mytilenian revolt in 428 BCE. Herodotus also notes andropodizing exercised by Greeks on other Greeks, such as the Spartan attack on Tegea, which resulted in a Spartan loss in the andropodizing of the Spartans. Xenophon supports the practice as well, asserting that it is an eternal law among all human beings that when a city is captured by those at war, both the bodies of those in the city and their valuables belong to those who take it. Xenophon reiterates this practice, including guidelines for implementing it, and memorabilia. The Greeks of the Iliad often identify the rape of the Trojan women as emblematic of the fall of Troy. The women's captivity and enslavement is the ultimate symbol of Greek triumph. The epic heroes distinguish between particular phases of war. The city and the men within it are destroyed, and then the women are taken as captives, along with other movable booty. As Nestor proclaims to his fellow Achaeans, Therefore, let no man be urgent to take the way homeward until after he has lain in bed with the wife of a Trojan to avenge Helen's longing to escape and her lamentations. The final victory is achieved only after the Trojan women have become captive slaves to the Greeks. But if not only for the sake of war spoils, then why target the women, especially the freeborn? Is it just freeborn women who are targeted? The Iliad identifies several captive women, all the freeborn status and members of an elite or royal family, such as Chryseis and Briseis. The epic also alludes to the possible and inevitable captivity of the wife of King Priam, Hecuba, as well as their daughters, notably Cassandra and Polyxena, and of the wife of Hector, Andromache. Besides these named freeborn women are the unspecified number of unnamed women, likely of varying status, who are raped and taken captive, or raped and killed or left to die. The Greek soldier Thersides scolds Agamemnon during an assembly, wondering what more the king could want after already having first rights to the choicest of captured women. Son of Atreus, what thing further do you want or find fault with now? Your shelters are filled with bronze. There are plenty of the choicest women for you within your shelter, whom we Achaeans give to you first of all whenever we capture some stronghold. A precedent had long been set for capturing women and giving them to the conquering men, with the choicest of the women being saved for the military leaders. Later, Agamemnon, when decreeing concessions he will make for Achilles in order to regain the hero's cooperation, states that Achilles can choose for himself twenty of the loveliest of the Trojan women after Helen a promise which is later reiterated by Odysseus during the embassy's consultation. These examples highlight the type of women or girls sought after as captives. These are young women of or nearing marriageable age who are sexually desirable and who are most susceptible to being docile in their subjugation. 
The freeborn of these women, especially those who once belonged to the Trojan male elites, such as Priam and Hector, represent the pinnacle of victory against Troy. The rape and enslavement of one such as Andromache twists the knife of Hector's failure to protect his city and his family, further exacerbates the eradication of Hector's honor, glory, and house, and savages the honor of Troy itself. According to the Greek army, the aim of the Trojan War is to win Agamemnon's honor and Menelaus's from the Trojans. The house of Atreus was dishonored when Paris violated the oath of Xenia and abducted Helen. Retaliation requires that the Greeks fight to reclaim its honor from the Trojans, and the personal vendetta is against Paris and his family. What better way to claim vengeance against the Trojans than by taking sexual ownership of the Trojan men's women? Even those freeborn women not named, but nevertheless raped and taken as captives, represent the highest victory. Freeborn women give birth to new citizens, perpetuating the community at large and ensuring its continued successful existence. To rape these women and to bear children by them is to subvert the system. Now the freeborn woman bears children for the enemy and her former community is rendered barren. The expression used when describing the captivity of these women is to take away the day of their liberty. Hector admits to his wife Andromache that of all the consequences he fears should Troy fall, from the devastation and pain endured by his family to the deaths of his Trojan brothers, it is her enslavement he fears most. He hopes to be dead before his wife is dragged away, her liberty taken, so that he cannot witness such violation and defeat. Hector says, but it is not so much the pain to come of the Trojans that troubles me, not even of Priam the king nor Hecabe, not the thought of my brothers who in their numbers and valor shall drop in the dust under the hands of men who hate them, as troubles me the thought of you when some bronze-armored Achaean leads you off, taking away your day of liberty in tears. But may I be dead and the piled earth hide me under before I hear you crying, and know by this that they drag you captive. The expressions used to describe the daughters and wives being dragged away and dragged off may indicate sexual violation, and more pointedly, aggravated rape. The fate of the Trojan women is indisputably grim. The women not raped and then killed or left to die face habitual rape and a life of enslavement to the enemy of their city and the murderers of their husbands. Through the Trojan women's sexual violation, Homer expresses a narrative of sexual violence against women, which signifies ultimate male victory for the Greeks and bitter defeat for the Trojans. Outside of Homer, the politicization of women's bodies is a theme further explored in Euripidean tragedy, where the Trojan women are the favored cast of characters. In Hecuba, Euripides examines the analogy between marriage and sacrifice and draws attention to the destructive effects of war on eroticism, particularly with regards to the male gaze and the woman at whom the gaze is directed. As a result, the female body, specifically how it is treated, once again becomes a decisive tool for validating male victory. Talthibius, Agamemnon's herald, tells Hecuba of Polyxena's sacrifice, describing in detail how honorably the Trojan princess carried herself in the last moments of her life. The description of Polyxena just before the knife is taken to her throat is highly eroticized. When she heard the command of her masters, she seized her robe and tore it from the shoulder to the middle of her waist by the navel, and showed her breasts, lovely as a goddess's statue. Polyxena's actions may be intended to inspire admiration and even pity among the male soldiers witnessing her sacrifice. However, the way in which she is described suggests that her actions may also have had more sexual implications. Post-Homeric accounts of the recovery of Helen describe Menelaus' intention to kill his estranged wife, being eradicated by his rekindled desire after once again gazing upon her beauty. In some accounts, Helen is partially nude, her breasts exposed. While Xena, like Helen, may be using her sexuality to thwart male aggression and impending violence. Her revealing herself would, in this context, be a final plea to save her life in the hopes that the sight of her nudity would eradicate the soldier's intent to sacrifice her much like Helen's nudity, eradicated Menelaus' intent to kill her, suggesting that a woman's exposed body could overpower male-instigated violence. That Talthibius emphasizes Polyxena's beautiful breasts and even compares her form to a goddess in this moment of violence and imminent death suggests that Polyxena was successful in captivating the soldiers' gazes. Having exposed her body, Polyxena reveals that which is usually kept hidden from public view, the nude young female form. 
She diverts their gazes from the forthcoming tragic event for which she will suffer the greatest, instead turning their thoughts to erotic associations of sexual engagement with the beautiful nude maiden presented before their eyes, potentially saving herself in the process. However, according to Euripides, Polyxena's sacrifice was required to honor Achilles, the ghost of whom appeared before the Greeks as they prepared to sail away from Troy, demanding that they not leave his tomb without its prize of honor. After much deliberation, the Greeks chose Hecuba's daughter Polyxena, following Odysseus's advice not to reject the most valiant of their heroes, simply to avoid shedding a slave's blood. Polyxena's sacrifice was unavoidable, regardless of what pleas she used to change her circumstances. There is perhaps a sense of mockery in her actions as well. In revealing herself, Polyxena forces the men to confront the reality of their decision to sacrifice the young girl, calling into question whether or not their actions for the sake of Achilles are truly as noble as they would rather believe, and further heightening the eroticized violence committed against her. Polyxena's fate even perverts the ritual of sacrifice. She is likened to a goddess, then sacrificed in honor of a deceased mortal man. Here, the eroticized sacrifice demonstrates that even in death, a woman's body can be subjected to sexual violation for the sake of validating male victory, both Achilles and the Greek armies. Two forms of sexual violation are referenced in Hecuba, Polyxena's sacrifice and Cassandra's sexual enslavement. Their fates are contrasted in the parode. That the Greeks should crown Achilles' tomb with fresh blood, and that they would never set the love of Cassandra above Achilles' spear. This contrast emphasizes the fates that await female war captives, death or sexual enslavement. In either case, their bodies are sacrificed for the enemy. Euripides echoes Homer's characterization of the fall of Troy as metaphorically symbolized when the Trojan women fall victim to sexual violation. The chorus's final ode laments this fate. Ilium, our fatherland, no longer will you be numbered among the cities that stand unsacked. Such is the cloud of Greeks that has covered you about on every side, ravaging you with the spear. You are shorn of your crown of towers and stained most pitiably with the disfiguring mark of smoke. No more, poor city, shall I tread your streets. Troy is ravaged, its city shorn of its crowns and left with stains of defilement. This imagery of violation evokes the rape of the Trojan women. Euripides' Hecuba and Trojan women further explore the delicate situation in which captive women find themselves after the war is over and the dust is settled. Their survival depends on blurring the distinction between concubine and hetaira. As Ruth Scodel notes, when a woman becomes the sexual slave of a captor, the, quote, gift exchange of normal marriage is replaced by the violent death of the woman's kin, end quote. The captive woman's transfer from one man in house to another is distorted by her lack of sexual consent on one hand and on the other by the conspicuous lack of familial involvement where the woman's loyalty is split between husband and natal family. This testing of loyalties causes significant emotional turmoil. As Lindromache laments in Trojan Women, if I put my love for Hector out of my mind and open my heart to my present husband, I shall appear disloyal to him who has died. But if I loathe my present husband, I shall incur the hatred of my own master. Yet they say that a single night dispels the hatred a woman feels for her bedmate. But Hecuba advises Andromache that it is more prudent to submit to her new master and to use her womanly enticements to woo him for the sake of a more comfortable enslavement. Hector is dead and tears will not bring him back, Hecuba reminds her daughter-in-law, and she would serve his memory better by surviving and giving the chance of a new Troy greater possibility by raising Hecuba's grandson. These sentiments throughout Trojan women are echoed in Euripides' Hecuba. Hecuba needs Agamemnon's help to take revenge against Polymester, the murderer of her son Polydorus, and she implies that because Cassandra is Agamemnon's concubine, Polydorus is essentially his brother-in-law, and he owes it to his kinsmen and his kinsmen's family to facilitate Hecuba's plans. Hecuba argues, well then, perhaps this part of my speech will be for naught, appealing to Aphrodite, but still I shall make the point. My prophetic daughter, whom the Phrygians call Cassandra, sleeps at your side. What weight will you give, my lord, to those knights of love? Or what return shall my daughter have for her loving embraces in bed? And what return shall I have for her? Listen, therefore. Do you see the dead man here? In benefiting him, it is your kinsman by marriage that you benefit. On the basis of Nomos and Dike, Hecuba argues that Agamemnon is lawfully obligated to avenge Polydorus, as her late son had been under Polymester's protection by the ordinance of Exenia. 
That oath which Paris had broken when he took Helen from Menelaus, and that which Polymester broke when he murdered her son. When Agamemnon remains unmoved by her appeal, Hecuba exploits Cassandra's sexuality to convince Agamemnon that he is under moral obligation to punish Polymester. Cassandra goes so far as to consider her relationship with Agamemnon a marriage, and Hecuba uses this quasi-marriage to insist that Agamemnon, the new male head of their quasi-family, is responsible for avenging Polydorus. Agamemnon had already proven loyal to Hecuba's family when he voted against sacrificing Polyxena for the sake of his relationship with Cassandra. By the same principle, he should avenge Cassandra's brother's death, especially as he benefits from Cassandra's intimate company. Furthermore, Trojan Women indicates that Agamemnon specifically chose Cassandra, rather than receiving her by gift or by lot. The sexual bond between Agamemnon and Cassandra imposes certain obligations on the man, so long as the woman is willing to acquiesce to his authority. As Cassandra remains silent in this appeal, Hecuba stands in for her daughter. Cassandra's body is thus used as a political bargaining tool. Though she is a victim of what constitutes male victory, even in her captivity her body can be used to manipulate male ideologies of honor and obligation. Agamemnon ultimately agrees that Polymester should be punished, but he does not agree to personally avenge Polydorus' death due to his loyalty to the Greek army. However, out of pity for Hecuba, he agrees to turn a blind eye when Hecuba puts her plan for revenge into motion. While Cassandra may be Agamemnon's slave, she, or rather her mother, is not without some control over how her body is used in captivity. In this case, the intimate relationship between Agamemnon and Cassandra enables Hecuba to manipulate Agamemnon's sense of honor, revealing the potential consequences of male victory achieved at the expense of women's freedom. Amidst the tumult of the Trojan War, the mythical heroes exhibit behaviors and or intentions of sexual violence against women while the heroines face a grim future of captivity. It is the fate of the Trojan women which ultimately determines whether the Greek men are victorious in their war against Troy. For some women, such as Cassandra, their sexuality can prove to be their means of empowerment, while for others, such as Polyxena, their sexuality can only get them so far. Vase paintings occasionally pair scenes of combat with images of erotica. Several examples depict erotica on one side and a battle scene on the other, and in some examples the complement to the erotica is a reference to the Trojan cycle. From an observational viewpoint, this pairing is noteworthy as it may visually express this inseparable link between male physical aggression and female sexual subjugation, although to what extent these vases were intended to reflect cultural perceptions of sex and violence is indeterminable. Nevertheless, as Homer and Euripides make clear, the sexual ownership of women's bodies is the foundation upon which the ideology of male victory is built. And as Hecuba laments, the resulting inescapable fate that distorts the marriage between former husband and wife to one between captor and slave transforms the daughters of Troy to brides of disaster.